Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. He dedicated his life to the community and cracking down on the very crime that investigators say took his life. Tonight, friends and former colleagues of retired Converse Assistant Police Chief Rodney Rex Reiner spoke about the legacy he leaves behind after being killed by a suspected drunk driver. Our Devin Clark with our top story. He was a fun guy to be around. He, he was very, very uh, knowledgeable on everything. Rodney Reiner, known affectionately as Rex, was also said to be a by-the-books policeman. 27 years on the job was more than enough time for him to make a huge impact on those he came in contact with. He started as a police officer, worked himself all the way up to assistant chief, very involved with the community, Eagle Scout, FBI Academy graduate. Inspiring colleagues seem to be part of Reiner's job with the Converse Police Department before retiring in March of 2017. He encouraged me to continue off my training and education and how important it would be. A trusted voice heavily relied on by Converse city leaders. He was the only person I allowed to speak for me because I knew that uh, he'd do right. Around 9 o'clock last night, San Antonio police say that the SUV Reiner was in was struck by a woman in her 20s named Jean Nicole Bernice Coutros. The crash happening on Nacogdoches near O'Connor when SAPD says Coutros sped off after being pulled over for driving erratically. She's now charged with intoxication manslaughter and evading arrest and detention with a vehicle. Those charges pointing to a sadly ironic ending to Reiner's life. And he would tell you, there is, no, there is no guarantee tomorrow. Do everything that you possibly can today. And so for it to end this way is exactly what he meant. Reiner was in his late 50s. He leaves behind two sons and two grandchildren. We understand that flags will be lowered to half staff until his funeral, which will include a police and fire department procession. Reporting in the newsroom, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. New changes to how the quarantine at JBSA Lackland will work as the Grand Princess cruise ship passengers come in. We are now learning Lackland could soon be a quarantine for Texans only. Garrett Berger live at Kelly Field to explain. Garrett. Last night, 98 passengers from the Grand Princess cruise ship landed here at Kelly Field. 91 of them Texans already. Now, just over an hour ago, citing a phone conversation with the U.S. Health and De Department of Health and Human Services official, the mayor's office says there will be more flights over the next day or two with Texans and non-Texans alike as the, as the federal government reshuffles the evacuees around. The mayor's office said in a statement partly, quote, Dr. Cadlick, that HHS official, conveyed that the goal is to consolidate all Texans at Lackland and to transport the non-Texans to their home states. By moving evacuees to their home states, this will begin to level the obligation for all communities as each prepares for potential community spread. Now, this comes just a few hours after we learned non-Texan quarantine patients would not be sent to the Texas Center for Infectious Disease anymore, the state-run facility where those who tested positive for the virus had been going. The governor's office sending a, go a spokesman for Governor Greg Abbott sending us a statement reading partly, quote, Governor Abbott has been assured that no one who is not a Texan will be released to a local or state health facility so as not to take away resources from Texans who have or may contract the coronavirus or are dealing with other health issues. The spokesman also confirmed that had been at Abbott's request. Now, the city is preparing for a possible outbreak of its own, though there have been no cases of community transition of, transmission of the novel coronavirus here so far. Metro health officials say they are ready to test for the virus, though they will only be doing that for patients who meet certain criteria. Live at Kelly Field, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. The coronavirus giving college students here at San Antonio at least one more week of spring break. The Alamo Colleges, Texas A&M San Antonio, UTSA, Trinity University, and St. Mary's University all announcing campuses will be closed for at least one more week to prepare for the coronavirus. As of today, classes for all of these colleges and universities are expected to resume on March 23rd. UTSA and Texas A&M San Antonio say at that point all classes will be taught online. St. Mary's University says it is preparing staff to possibly do the same. As for Our Lady of the Lake and Incarnate Word, according to their websites, they are monitoring the virus, but at this point have not announced any changes. Trinity also asking students not to return to their dorms 
unless it's to pick up their belongings. A student can file an exemption if they have nowhere to go. Meanwhile, CPS Energy today saying that for the time being, it will not be cutting off power to people who fall behind on payments because of concerns about paying their bills in person due to COVID-19. Mayor Ron Nirenberg and the San Antonio City Council supporting this move. CPS Energy reminds customers there are many ways to make your payments, including by mail, by phone or online. They're also available to respond to non bill related issues, either by phone or online as well. You can find more information about your options posted on our website at KSAT.com. As the coronavirus continues to spread, a lot of things are changing very fast from the number of people who have COVID-19 to the number of events that have been affected. We are keeping track of all of it right now on KSAT.com. That's where you can find the latest information on cancellations, closures and what you need to know to make sure you and your family are doing what you need to do to stay safe. We are putting it all right there on our homepage again at KSAT.com. New at six with the state seeking the death penalty for accused cop killer Otis McCain. Jury selection, which is now underway, becomes more complex. McCain is accused in the execution style shooting of veteran SAPD detective Ben Marconi. Paul Venema takes a look at how jury selection is conducted in death penalty cases. Both prosecutors and defense attorneys are in the process of reviewing questionnaires completed by 200 potential jurors in the capital murder case of Otis McCain. The next step, the lawyers and McCain will meet here with individual prospective jurors to review their questionnaire. They give you an insight into the thoughts uh, and views of the panel members before they come to court. The stakes here are as high as they get since prosecutors are seeking the death penalty. McCain is accused of shooting veteran SAPD detective Ben Marconi to death as Marconi sat in his patrol car. Both the state and the defense team have identical definitions of what they're looking for in a juror. So someone that can be open-minded, that can really be open-minded and doesn't have extreme views on either end. Their job as a juror could be complex. If they convict McCain, they'll have to consider two special issues. The special issues are very technical and you really, really have to explain it to them. Those issues are, is the defendant a future danger to society? And are there any mitigating circumstances that dictate that the death penalty not be enforced? If the answer to each question is no, the sentence is execution. If one question is answered yes, it's life in prison without the possibility of parole. Interviewing prospective jurors, which normally takes about a day or two in most cases, is expected to last at least a month. Obviously, there's still a lot of work to be done before a jury takes their place here, but at this point, it looks as though that'll happen on the 27th of next month. Paul Venom, a case at 12 News. Tonight, the Bear County Republican Party is doing what local Democratic Party did last night, canvassing the results of the 2020 primary. Then tomorrow, the elections office will post the official results on its website. Yet at one point, the GOP chair added a bit of drama by saying she didn't trust the results and said they should be thrown out. Jesse Degollado says the chance of that has been described by a political scientist as vanishingly small. After telling Bear County commissioners about alleged discrepancies in the 2020 primary, local Republican Party chair Cynthia Bream later would say, We don't certify. You don't have election. What are you going to do? Throw it out. Not so, according to the Texas Election Code. It states the county chair shall canvass the precinct election returns. And if Bream doesn't, the code goes on to say the state chair may perform any administrative duty of the county chair. As far as throwing out the results of a primary? Have other elections met the same fate? I'm not aware of any uh, that I've seen in recent history or and I have <laughs> no knowledge of even distant history. Other than technical glitches that delayed consolidating the results for hours, Crockett says he's not aware of anything that would warrant starting over. I can't imagine a situation that would provoke that barring uncovering some sort of malfeasance. <laughs> as in wrongdoing, especially by a public official. Even then, now that a record quarter of a million people in Bear County have cast their ballots, throwing those out, Crockett says, would anger voters. Probably directed at the people who are actually agitating for this. After all, he says the nation has fought to protect the fundamental right to vote, considered sacred by many. So to have that messed with is 
uh, not a wise course of action. Well, even then, the Secretary of State's office tells me that decision would be up to a judge. Also, the chair of the state Republican Party, James Dickey, says after speaking to Brim, he doesn't have any reason to believe she won't certify the results. In the newsroom, Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jesse. Time saver traffic now. Let's take a look at a pretty significant backup here. This is the camera view at Loop 410 at Ingram. This is the eastbound lanes where you're seeing the big tie up here, all because of an accident right here at the on ramp at Zhang's Lane. 410 and Ingram, that's the camera view, but definitely nobody going anywhere quickly on those main eastbound lanes of 410, really, as well as uh, the access road there off to the side. New at six, a domestic violence survivor telling her story in an innovative way, catching the attention of agencies like SAPD and the city's health department. Courtney Friedman spoke to Karen Chatham about why she's using her tough experience as a platform to discuss issues like abuse, mental health and HIV. It's part of Courtney's series confronting domestic violence called Loving in Fear. In this house, we like a flock of birds. These characters are in a play, but their words and stories are very real. The play, Karen Chatham's Hurting Became a Habit, was written by Karen herself. She was married to her abuser for 23 years. I was open to that because I was still dealing with the hurt from being a kid that was surviving molestation. As part of her recovery, she started an organization called We Speak on Purpose. I write to bring attention to social issues most people won't talk about comfortably in their own home. So we on purpose go out and we speak about family violence, survival, we talk about mental health, and we talk about HIV. This weekend, she and her cast will perform the play at UIW with the support of countywide organizations including SAPD's Crisis Response Team and Metro Health's HIV Prevention Team. After the play is over and people are all emotional and they're like, oh my God, I'm going through that and I didn't know what to do or who to speak to, we connect them with the person and link them into care. Get them tested right there. What does this issue look like? Metro Health Violence Prevention Manager Jenny Hickson says all these health issues are interconnected. People who are HIV positive, that sometimes that disclosure in and of itself can be the start of a violent episode. We also know that people who are in relationships that they're experiencing violence, oftentimes can't negotiate safe sex. There is life after a storm. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And you can see the play for free this Saturday and Sunday at 3 p.m. at the UIW Maybe Library Auditorium. Again, services and resources will be provided right there on the spot. Parental discretion is advised. Taking a live look outside with live cam on this Wednesday, halfway through spring break for some. Maybe it'll be longer, we don't know, but the sun returned today and it was a beautiful day to be out and about. If you yeah, had beautiful day out and about, a lot of sunshine, temperatures climbing into the mid to even upper 90s. The aquifer, upper 80s rather, the aquifer is down two tenths of a foot over the past 24 hours. Oak is now high on the pollen count. That's going to be on everybody's mind because we'll really start to wheeze and sneeze from those oak trees. I'll be back with a look at the forecast. We're talking rain chances coming up. Hard to believe 85 degrees out there right now. One of the warmest days we've had in a while here. Yeah. We were able to see abundant sunshine after morning fog. And you know, tomorrow will be similar, uh, but we're going to hang on to those clouds a little bit longer. Now, before the break, I went ahead and mentioned that oak is high today. And our very own Adam Kasky went ahead and sent in this picture to us. You can see this is his oak tree in his front or backyard. I'm not entirely certain, but notice the old growth right there in that oak leaf. And and then right behind it, those are those catkins that have the pollen within them. They're starting to grow. And once they become that brownish color, that's when that pollen really starts to get going. By the way, uh, oak trees are a lawn owner's nightmare in the springtime because these catkins, they push off those oak leaves and that's why you end up raking just about every day. So it is almost peak oak season. These catkins, which are still green, but will eventually become brown, are the key to that. And again, just a reminder that we peak in oak season in late March and early April. Uh, right now, oak is high at 640. And I just want to warn people that this is about to happen. You're about to start to wheeze and sneeze. If you have an oak allergy, uh, don't panic. 
uh, because again, it's just an oak allergy uh, out there. There's a lot going on uh, with COVID-19 and I just wanted to put that on your radar. Let's take a look at the time lapse uh, outside. Uh, we have had beautiful blue skies for the second part of the day. The high temperature was 85 degrees today. That is well above average by 13 degrees and our morning low is well above average as well. 65 degrees because of the high humidity. We're going to have a very similar day tomorrow, except I do think that will hang on to morning clouds just a little bit longer. Take a look at high temperatures today around the KSAT 12 viewing area. 92 for the high in Catula, 91 in Del Rio, 90 in Carrizo Springs. All in all, though, most of us in the mid to upper 80s today. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, fast forward a little bit into time, and we're going to talk just for a second here about uh, the uh, areas of high humidity that are out there. Seems like my weather graphics have frozen on me as they are wont to do nowadays, unfortunately. We'll see if we can go ahead in time. There we go this evening. Here's what you can expect. Uh, we're going to be looking at temperatures falling slowly into the 70s in the evening hours, and we will see mostly cloudy skies uh, by midnight, and then that'll result in some patchy fog early tomorrow morning uh, as we uh, really start to see those clouds kind of hang on a little bit longer, but still we should still see some sunshine in the afternoon. Round 82 for the high for your Thursday south wind at 5 to 10 miles per hour. It is icky and sticky and gross outside. We've got high humidity with dew points in the 60s. Not only do we have high humidity today, but we're going to have high humidity for the foreseeable future. Unfortunately, those south of Highway 90 are in a drought, and it would be really nice if we could see this humidity turn into rain. Well, we're not going to have a significant chance for rainfall until later on in the weekend and uh, potentially early next week. Here's a look at our weather setup around the nation. We really are pretty quiet across the central plains, but the reason for that is because we have a high pressure system south of San Antonio in Mexico. And meanwhile, look out toward Los Angeles. You can see some spinning in the upper levels of the atmosphere. That's a low pressure system. That's going to allow for this high pressure system to kind of kick on off to the east. That'll open up our atmosphere to a chance for some rain, but we do have to wait until the weekend. Uh, and even then it'll be isolated at best as a front kind of stalls out around San Antonio. So we'll call it 30% Saturday, 30% Sunday, 30% Monday, and eventually we'll see a better chance for rain by the middle of next week. Uh, but still, fairly uniform forecast over the next several days. Not really a significant chance for rain tomorrow or, third or Friday, but by the weekend, isolated rain just about every day. And staying plenty warm out there. Highs near 80, Myra. All right, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Is there any timeline at this point for the NBA to make a decision on whether or not fans will be allowed to continue to come to games? Yes, they will make that decision by tomorrow. They met today. The consensus earlier was maybe they suspend operations, and now they seem to be drawn to the fact they'll just play the games without fans. When we come back, more about that, including what the Warriors are doing. Is DeMar Dunn in San Antonio? Funny response after the game last night, and the Warriors setting the precedent playing their home games now without any fans. Coming up. I said that, it's a rumor. You know who reported it? Did my mama say it? <laughs> no. Don't listen to it then. The Spurs star DeMar DeRozan's response was asking for reports. He plans to opt out of his contract with the Spurs this summer if he doesn't reach a new long-term deal to silver and black in big board sports. Did my mama say it? <laughs> right now, the Spurs are just focused on trying to keep their 22-season streak alive and making the playoffs by beginning the final stretch of 20 games left in the regular season. The huge win over their I-35 rivals last night, the Dallas Mavericks. Despite the fact that Mavericks star Luka Doncic shook off a sprained wrist, still scored a game-high 38 points, had the Mavs out to a double-digit lead on more than one occasion. But thanks to the return of LaMarcus Aldridge who missed the last six games of the sore shoulder, the Spurs were not only able to recover but extend their own lead to double digits in the second half, buying LMA Spurs high of 24 points. Spurs avoid the season sweep by Dallas for the first time in franchise history, 119-109. And while they are still 12th in the Western Conference with just 19 games left now, they're only four back of the Memphis Grizzlies for the eighth and final playoff spot. With more on the Spurs' big win, here's our David Sears. 
LaMarcus Aldridge back last night against the Mavericks. He started off slow, 4 for 11 in the first half, picked it up in the second half. Matter of fact, had 11 in the fourth quarter. He was happy to be back, and Rudy Gay was really happy to have LaMarcus back after he had to fill in for him at center a couple of times. He was huge for us. Came up big, some big plays. And it's just, more than anything, it's just good to have another big out there. <laughs> actual big. So, you know, um, we've been scrambling, trying to, trying to fill in for him, but uh, it's good to have him back. What I was pleased with was he shot the ball. He didn't shoot it as well as he's able, but he didn't shy away from it at all. He just kept shooting him when he was open, which was great, and he ended up hitting a couple of big ones for us. Yeah, I always get mad, you know, when I stop shooting it. So I stayed with it tonight, and I just kept shooting it, and, you know, things went well down the stretch for me. LaMarcus Aldridge gets a lot of the credit. Barrick White deserves some, too. 14 points, 9 assists, running the point for the Spurs last night against the Mavs. With the Spurs, David Sears, KSAT 12 Sports. That's right. DeJounte may be out for a while with that uh, injury to his leg. Now, get this. The Denver Nuggets are up next, 730 on Friday in the AT&T. So we'll see if fans are allowed in that game. The National Director of Allergy and Infectious Diseases told a congressional committee today that he would not allow fans to any more games due to the coronavirus. That's what Dr. Anthony Fauci told the House Oversight Committee just hours before the NBA Board of Governors are to meet in a conference call to decide what the league will do going forward to protect players and coaches during what is being called out pandemic by the World Health Organization. The NBA is considering a number of scenarios, including playing games without fans, something the NCAA has already decided for March Madness, moving games to neutral arenas and suspending operations altogether. The Golden State Warriors have already decided to proceed with the games without fans starting tomorrow against the Nets, and that appears to be the way the league is leaning starting tomorrow. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Houston Texans have mutually agreed with Jonathan Joseph to let the veteran cornerback test the free agent market. Joseph, who is now 35 years old, has spent the last nine seasons with the Texans, including 14 games last season of 51 tackles, 13 pass breakups, and one interception. But overall, he is the Texans franchise leader in interceptions with 17. Here's part of the statement released by the Texans. Today, that says, in part, the entire Houston, Texas organization thanks Jonathan for his contributions he made to our team and the Houston community. We wish him and his family all the best as he pursues free agency. Getting back once more, for those of you that did not hear this, the NCAA now for March Madness is banning all fans from all their tournament games. The first time in NCAA history this has taken place due to the coronavirus. And we'll see if that now spreads to, if you will, to the NBA starting tomorrow. And it more than likely will be the case. Wow. Unbelievable. Right. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Greg. So to comment six, could the deadline to file your taxes be pushed back due to the coronavirus? My Democratic lawmakers are asking the IRS to at least consider it. And the latest on the attempts to slow down the spread of this virus. Next. The number of coronavirus cases in the U.S. has now topped 1,000 and is growing quickly. As Daryl Forges reports, several White House meetings with public health officials and business leaders took place today as states and cities with the worst outbreaks try to take measures on their own. Is the worst yet to come, Dr. Fauci? Yes, it is. The nation's top public health officials on Capitol Hill Wednesday morning warning Americans to be prepared for the coronavirus situation to get worse before it gets better. We've got to assume that it's going to get worse and worse and worse. The officials emphasizing the next month will be critical. Wednesday was the first full day of a one-mile containment area around New Rochelle, New York, where dozens of cases have been traced back to one attorney. The goal is to prevent exposure because if there is no exposure, there is no risk. Governor Andrew Cuomo declared the zone in the suburb as New York City looks at more ways to keep its dense population safe. You're always within six feet of a person. So we, we really need to take more aggressive actions. More areas taking those precautions. In Chicago and Pittsburgh, St. Patrick's Day parades are canceled. And Washington, Georgetown University, adding to the list of campuses suspending in-person classes. And in Santa Clara County, California, where dozens of people have tested positive, gatherings of more than 1,000 people are temporarily banned. It's all in line with what federal officials recommended. As a public health official, anything that has large crowds is something that would give uh, yeah. a risk to spread. The World Health Organization on Wednesday declared the coronavirus outbreak a pandemic. And Dr. Anthony Fauci also says that the coronavirus is 10 times more lethal than the actual flu. And also lawmakers are urging the president to call for a national state of emergency. In Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Daryl Forges.
The U.S. Treasury is reportedly considering pushing back the tax deadline as coronavirus continues to spread. According to the New York Times, the Treasury and White House have talked about extending tax season beyond April 15th. That was after House Democrats reached out to the IRS to find out how the coronavirus outbreak could affect the agency and its ability to help taxpayers and process their returns. The Times reports that last week, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said a delay has been discussed, but isn't something that is currently being considered. We'll now add the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo to the list of big events that have been called off due to concerns about the coronavirus. The Houston City Council deciding today to pull the plug on one of the biggest such shows in the country. It was supposed to end March 22nd, but city officials opted to shut it down now. Gates closed at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Rodeo organizers are trying to figure out now how to refund tickets. Thousands of people in the Houston area signed a petition to cancel the rodeo to help slow the spread of COVID-19. Back here at home, March is National Nutrition Month. Thousands of organizations are putting extra focus on ending food insecurities, including the San Antonio Food Bank. Today, they hosted their sixth annual Nutrition Summit. At the event, healthcare and educational professionals discussed the impact of food insecurity to children. Organizers say the residents in the area are always looking to ways to end the stigma. We're a community, and so um, we know that we have to take care of our children um, and our families. And so um, people are really interested in finding ways to address that. Nearly 300 people attended the summit. The San Antonio Food Bank provides millions of pounds of food to more than 500 organizations throughout Southwest Texas. It may not be a big honor having a newly discovered insect named after you, but Lady Gaga got that anyway. The new bug, where it came from, and why Gaga still to come. And a new menu item coming to Taco Bells across the country called the Triple Lupa. It's just what it sounds like and looks like there, what customers can expect from the extra large quesadilla. But first happening around America today, Harvey Weinstein sentenced to 23 years in prison. The disgraced producer faced between 5 and 29 years in jail after last month's convictions on a first degree criminal sexual act and third degree rape. The charges were based on testimony by Miriam Haley and Jessica Mann, who both spoke at sentencing today. Weinstein also faces felony sex assault charges in Los Angeles. Elon Musk says he has plans to build a new Tesla factory somewhere in the central United States, but hasn't found the right spot yet. The Tesla CEO announced on Twitter the factory will be for the Tesla Cybertruck. The electric pickup is set to arrive in November, but Musk admitted initial orders have exceeded expectations. In addition, he says his company is eyeing the East Coast for production of Tesla's new Model Y SUV. We're in the KSAT newsroom on the News at 9 set with a look at what's coming up tonight at 9. And everybody's talking about coronavirus, making preparations. That includes Haven for Hope. Our Tiffany Huertas takes a look tonight at how that facility is preparing for the coronavirus. As the city prepares for the coronavirus, we take a look at how Haven for Hope is protecting the homeless community. Tonight, how they're keeping their facilities clean. You've also likely seen a long list of cancellations, events that have been canceled, impacts on the local economy. That's something that people are talking about, wondering how that's going to play out. We have the business editor from the San Antonio Express News who stopped by this week to talk about how that potential could have an impact here in San Antonio as COVID-19 continues to spread. Oh, so many things that it could impact. Yeah, definitely. Also coming up tonight at 9, something we do every single night at 9, something we hope will make you smile amid all of this coronavirus news, our trending segment. That is where we take a look at what is trending on our website, and some of it actually does have to do with some of the positive aspects, some things that are still going on despite the spread of this illness, things you can get out and still enjoy during spring break. Over this weekend, we've got the rundown for you. Much more coming up in trending tonight at nine. A breath of fresh air, perhaps. Yes, which Take I think pause. we all could use. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and there's plenty of sunshine out there today. Let's uh, turn it over to Sarah to talk about today's weather. It really was a beautiful day out there. Taking a live look outside with live cam over downtown San Antonio. Blue skies as we end the day here. 
We warmed up. It felt like a late spring day rather than an early spring day. Today the high was 85 degrees, the morning low 65. No rain to report in today's almanac, but just know that tonight patchy fog will be developing and overnight once again we'll see clouds by early tomorrow morning. 64 degrees as we start the day tomorrow. We'll start with fog, but we'll end up with some more sunshine. A great day to spend at the pool if you're on spring break. I'll be back with a look ahead to your forecast, including rain chances coming up. Taco Bell is trying to build the buzz for its newest creation of a menu favorite. Starting tomorrow, you can order what the chain is calling a triple lupa, an obvious play on the chalupa here, but that's a lot bigger. That's really actually three mini chalupas combined into what you just saw. Innovation in Mexican fast food. <laughs> Each section has a different flavor. Choose between nacho cheese, cheesy chipotle or chipotle. To grab one, just pull apart. Taco Bell says it made the triple lupa to easily tear apart. Triple lupa will cost around $3.50 plus tax. If it looks like something you want to try, the triple lupa will only be at Taco Bell's for a limited time. All right. Sounds like a figure skating move to me, the <laughs> triple lupa. Don't hurt yourself. Right? Electric car maker Tesla hitting a major milestone, 1 million cars made. CEO Elon Musk took to Twitter to congratulate Tesla employees. He included a picture of a Tesla and a large group of employees at what looks to be the automaker's Fremont, California factory. Now, since its founding 17 years ago, Tesla has cemented its position as the largest seller of electric vehicles in the U.S. The Tesla Model 3 sedan is America's most popular electric car. Tesla's stock has more than doubled in under six months, even amid all that market turmoil. All right. Next up today, sure, Grammys are nice, but how many pop superstars have an insect named after them? You can count Lady Gaga among that small group. This is the Kaikaya Gaga. Actually, that's the real Lady Gaga. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> the one we saw earlier, that's the bug. The insect is a newly identified species of tree hopper, apparently. It's a little known insect group that populates most forests on Earth. Lady Gaga, much better looking. <laughs> K Gaga is native to the Pacific coast of Nicaragua. A paper detailing the discovery was recently published in the journal Zootaxa, a peer reviewed scientific journal in animal taxonomy. The graduate student who discovered and named the new insect says K Gaga has, uh, what is it? Uh, crazy horns <laughs> and fashion sense that led him to the name. Lady Gaga has yet to comment on her namesake. Okay. Creepy. I'm glad we distinguished the two of those yes. there. I hate to confuse mm. people. March 11th is a day to celebrate the man who literally helped plant orchard after orchard of apples across the country. Today is National Johnny Appleseed Day. May sound like a folk legend. A lot mm -hmm. of people may think that's what it is, but he was a real guy. He was born John Chapman in 1774 and was famous for walking across the country planting trees and pears. Today is Johnny Appleseed Day because it comes during planting season. He also wore a pot on his head. Uh, but here's an interesting twist. The apples he planted were too bitter to eat, so they were used to make cider, which apparently was just fine for everyone. And a safe alternative to water on the frontier. March 11th is National Johnny Appleseed Day because it's during planting season. There is also a second Johnny Appleseed Day, which is on his birthday, <laughs> September 26th. He, he was he really big did. in Ohio yeah. history. He, a lot of orchards there. We learned about him in school. Oh, All absolutely. Right. So that's yeah. why you know about the, yes. the pot situation. Did he actually wear a pot on his head? Is a lot of the, the illustrations have that. <laughs> yeah, the cartoon version did. That's pretty interesting. I should have. Brought my pop from home and worn it on my head for the <laughs> newscast. But we are really going to be seeing a really nice stretch of days here with temperatures climbing into the 80s, continuing to climb into the 80s for the rest of the week. Today, though, was probably going to be our warmest day on deck because we were able to see abundant sunshine 
85 degrees for the high temperature and currently 85 degrees. South wind at 10 miles per hour and dew point at about 60. So it is a little humid. Take a look at the satellite. We started the day with complete cloud cover and fog, but quickly saw that burn off right around the lunch hour. That's why we were able to warm up. Then you take an, a trip down I-35 and it's been completely sunny all day because that temperatures are much warmer there. 91 in Catula, 91 Laredo, 90 in Carrizo Springs. Just got below 90 degrees in Del Rio, but it was at 90 earlier today. So a very warm spring day for us. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the 24 hour temperature change. So because we were able to see tons of sunshine, uh, we were uh, we were about 5 to 10 to even 15 degrees warmer than how we were this time yesterday. And just taking you through time here, just know that we'll start tomorrow morning with areas of fog once again, a lot like this morning. The thing that's going to be slightly different tomorrow is that we'll hang on to the clouds a little bit longer. So those clouds should start to clear right at around lunchtime or shortly after mostly cloudy in the afternoon, but still enough sunshine to make us warm. We'll once again be in the 80s tomorrow, just the low to mid 80s rather than to mid to upper 80s. Just about everywhere you look a high temperature in the 80s. That includes Bernie, Leon Springs, Holotus, Timberwood Park, out towards Seguin, Lavernia and down toward La Soya as well. So that's tomorrow's forecast. It is nice outside and it is spring break for many people. So if you do want to spend uh, your day tomorrow by the pool side, just know that the UV index is going to be high. You'll see a sunburn within 30 minutes if you don't use sunscreen, but we are not going to be extremely high just because we'll have a little bit more cloud cover and then as we look through the day, just know that those clouds are going to eventually burn off 73 by the lunch hour, 82 in the afternoon. A stray storm could be possible, especially on the coastal plain, but still a nice day to spend poolside south wind at 5 to 15 miles per hour. We are so humid outside. You can feel it when you step outside. We've got a steady uh, wind from the southeast bringing in that Gulf of Mexico moisture for all of south central Texas. We've got enough humidity at the surface that the atmosphere is just begging for an upper level disturbance to bring some rain. We've even got moisture up in the upper levels of the atmosphere in the form of Pacific moisture streaming in uh, from the Pacific moisture. It's uh, from the Pacific Ocean itself. We need a low pressure system to kickstart things. Thankfully, it does look like this low pressure system, which is currently off of the coast of South California, is going to swing pieces of energy our way by the end of the weekend and into early next next week. Now right now rain chances are not looking great or widespread, but it does look like we are going to be able to see a few showers and storms out there starting on Saturday again on Sunday and then again on Monday, even higher chance in the middle of next week. So it does look like we could eke out some rain and we really need the rainfall because areas south of Highway 90 are under extreme drought at the moment. So we'll take this chance for rain. It's not the best chance for rain in the books, but it is there again because of that low pressure system approaching. Just wrapping up everything for you. Nice day tomorrow after morning fog, 82 to 83 for the high. And then Friday, a little bit more cloud cover, isolated rain, isolated showers and storms will be possible Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're going to have a chance for rain in this messy forecast just about every day. No strong cold fronts in the future either. Every day temperatures will be close to 80 degrees by the afternoon. That includes St. Patrick's Day, which falls on a Tuesday this year. Raindrops in your green beer. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, good <laughs> phrase there. <Tim. laughs> Thanks, Sarah. In case you missed it, it's coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. We've made it to Wednesday, March 11th. Local college students getting one more week of spring break. Today, the Alamo Colleges, Texas A&M, San Antonio, UTSA, Trinity University, and St. Mary's University, all announcing campuses will be closed for at least one more week to prepare for the coronavirus. As of today, classes for all of the colleges and universities are expected to resume on March 23rd. UTSA and Texas A&M, San Antonio say at that point, all classes will be taught online. The changes are coming fast and furious. There's a Another major Texas event that has been canceled, the Houston Rodeo, shutting down in response to COVID-19 concerns. According to our sister station, KPRC, the rodeo grounds themselves were closed about an hour ago, 11 days early. 
Houston city officials making the announcement this morning after one case was confirmed in Montgomery County and it was not travel related. It was community based. Oh, what a night for Joe Biden. Voters on Super Tuesday 2 put Biden in the driver's seat for the Democratic nomination. Well, while Bernie Sanders is down, he says he's not out, not just yet. But Today, I say to the Democratic establishment, in order to win in the future, you need to win the voters. It's something special out there, a unique star that's never, ever been seen before. Astronomers are the first to spot it. It's about 1,500 light years away from home, it's nearly twice the size of our sun, and is pulsating on one side, so it gives it this signature teardrop shape. Kind of interesting, but absolutely massive. Take a look at time saver traffic as we wrap things up here over on the northeast side. We've got a traffic trouble spot, an accident here on the main lanes of I-35 and Topperwine Road. Yeah, smack dab in the middle of the highway here. You can see there as a white car looks like was involved in this wreck now up on the bed of a tow truck there right in the middle lanes. You've got first responders blocking traffic. Looks like I-35 itself is down to just one lane, maybe two right now. Even on the access road there, people probably trying to avoid this whole mess. That's backed up too. That tow truck, as we're watching it kind of pull over to the side, hopefully that relieves a little bit of this congestion, but definitely heavy traffic at 35 and Topper Wine. Let's take a look at your forecast tomorrow morning. We'll start off with areas of fog a lot like this morning, 65 degrees for the morning low. Then we'll start to see the sunshine around or shortly after lunch. That'll be enough to warm us up into the low 80s for the high temperature. It's going to be a pretty nice day tomorrow after that morning fog. Then we'll see a chance for isolated rain pretty much for the rest of the forecast after tomorrow. So have your case up weather app handy. All right, thanks, Sarah. And thanks for watching the news at six. See you back here tonight for the night beat. Don't forget the nine.